Uh, we have uh, three readings. Uh, I decided that since in the appointed epistle, which is from Galatians 3, and which will come second, since that speaks about our baptism, uh, that I would this morning uh, preach about baptism, and therefore joining with that epistle from Paul, which in chapter 3 towards the end at verse 26 speaks about our being sons of God. The word son is used because the son was the inheritor. Uh, uh, those of you who are women become sons of God in that sense, though we now use the phrase daughters of God uh, for those who are not men. Uh, but he says immediately, uh, for you were baptized into Christ, you who were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Uh, so in the light of that, we shall take from Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse uh, 26, uh, we shall take the story of a baptism in the early church of the Ethiopian eunuch, and Philip joins him on his travels, speaks to him about Christ, we read that he preached the good news, and then his response is to ask to be baptised. And then for the gospel, which will come after the reading of the epistle, we have from Mark's gospel, chapter 10, at verse uh, 16, I think, um, no, 13, at verse 13, we have people bringing their children to Jesus and the disciples wanting to forbid them. But Jesus says, God's kingly rule belongs to them. Hear the word of God in the Acts of the Apostles, in the letter to the Galatians, and in the Gospel according to Mark. So the reading is Acts 8, verses 26 to 38. And you can find it on page 1101 if you want to read it from your Bible. Philip the Ethiopian. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah and the prophet, Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water, why shouldn't I be baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The official answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. Next reading is from Galatians, chapter 3, 23 to 29. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. Now that the faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. 
You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and the heirs according to that promise. And Mark 10. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like these little children will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and he put his hands on them and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. In the passage that we heard from the Acts of the Apostles, uh, Philip speaks good news, that is, he preaches the gospel to this Ethiopian eunuch because he begins with a passage that had puzzled the Ethiopian eunuch, a passage about Isaiah, from Isaiah, which speaks of the servant of the Lord. He asks, who is the prophet speaking about here? And seizing the opportunity, Philip begins there and moves to speak about Jesus. And the response of the eunuch is to ask to be baptized. Now that might strike you as strange. There's not been any mention there of baptism. But in the early church, responding to the gospel meant that you received a sign of the gospel. And the sign of the gospel was baptism. And I want us to look at this because uh, it's something we don't associate in the same way nowadays with those who have faith and respond to the gospel because our practice, to which I will come later, uh, is normally to baptize the children of Christian parents. But of course, in this first generation, here were people coming from no faith at all, or if they were Jews, coming from a faith in God, but to a deeper faith, a faith in God who had made himself known in Jesus Christ. So we ask the question, why baptism? What does it mean? Who is to be baptized? And we find answers to those in different ways in the passage that we heard from the Acts of the Apostles, uh, because the response of the Ethiopian eunuch was to say, here is water. It might seem a strange response to the preaching of the gospel. But he knew that somehow baptism was continuing the preaching of the gospel. It was applying it to him in particular. The gospel is about God's forgiving love in Jesus Christ. And that forgiving love was now going to be applied to this one person, not to all the world at that moment, but to him. And it seems strange that it should be something like water. Because, you know, we tend to think of the Christian life and to think of God in very spiritual terms, far too spiritual. But God is the creator. We are created with bodies and minds and spirits, the whole person. And so God, when he is dealing with us, uses physical, material things and not simply, as you might think, inward spiritual things. And hence, uh, the use of water. Water is something physical, material, and we know in our daily life that we talk about actions speaking louder than words, Things done, things visibly displayed, make an impact on us. And so, for example, when uh, somebody is married, 
We don't simply have words that join the one with the other, which we do have. We have the joining of hands, the giving and receiving of a ring. They're not saying anything different, but they are, so to speak, enforcing it, communicating it through action and through symbol. And it is similar in the last moment of our lives in a funeral, uh, particularly more visibly so uh, when it's a burial. You don't simply have the, the coffin uh, placed in the, in the grave and the word said, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, earth to earth rather, there, dust to dust. You have earth thrown over it. Indeed, when I was in the Gambia, um, I was expecting only a little earth to be thrown and then to carry on with the service. They filled the whole grave with the earth uh, before we moved on to the rest of the service. I had to announce several hymns to keep us active in other ways and not simply having the grave filled with earth. But we use actions and, and symbols to express something of the finality of what is taking place. And so it is with baptism. It is expressing through that symbol and through water, which of course has a strong symbolic sense, it is expressing something uh, which is communicated also through preaching, but applied to that person. And, and then water, uh, as other uh, actions and symbols, uh, has a universal appeal. Words which we use, which I am using with you this morning, words can very easily divide us from other people. Uh, if I began talking in the technical language that I might do, and some of you might do as theologians, I could talk about the teleological argument or the ecclesiological reasons for baptizing, and you would think, well, that's a magnificent word. I have no idea what it means, but probably it is important. Just as doctors normally now assume that we understand an incredible amount of medical jargon when they could use something more simple. I did not realize what pneumonia was till I was a student in Sweden. And the Swedish word, they use the same word which they pronounce pneumonia, but their word for pneumonia is lung inflammation. And even if you don't have Swedish, you can tell immediately what is being said by lung inflammation. You see, we, we can have language which unites us, but we can so easily be divided. And so you will have children or grandchildren, you might use words and they would say, what do you mean? And the same is true across, uh, of course, the, the boundary of generation. Um, your children or grandchildren may say, that's wicked. And you think it's, it's perfectly all right, it's good. Only to discover, of course, they're using the word wicked in a totally different sense from the way that you were brought up to use it. Words can divide us. Uh, had you been, not that you would have been, one of the uh, hooligans on the streets of the various towns and cities of Paris where the football is carried on, uh, if you had been British against Irish, you could have used language to provoke the opposition, but if you had been a Russian to the British and you didn't have a command of English, your words would have communicated nothing, uh, but a brick would have communicated something. They would have known what you were up to at once. The action, the symbol expresses what words can't. And so water has a cross the religious life of the world and across cultures has expressed a number of things. One thing, of course, is washing, making clean. That is expressed in many cultures and many religions, that you, you wash symbolically as you come as a new person into that particular faith. And so water has that symbol of cleansing, we use uh, every day. But it also has a, a sense of giving life, of rejuvenating. 
Uh, we have experienced uh, splendid dry and sunny weather, but uh, those of us who have had to water uh, new plants in the garden have been glad of a little rain, especially at night rather than during the day, because water gives life. And so there is a meaning communicated through the symbol and the action, just as there is through the words that Philip has been speaking to the eunuch. It is about God's forgiving, enlivening love, his cleansing of us from our past. And then, of course, uh, it's historical. I mean by that, people may say sometimes, well, why couldn't we use some other symbol? People have sometimes said, well, we, uh, we, we don't drink wine normally or the fruit of the grape. Uh, why don't we have uh, a tea? Uh, that's what we have mostly. Or why don't we use Ribena? That is a black currant juice for those who don't know. The reason we don't use them is because that was not what Jesus gave us. The Christian faith is historical. It's rooted in what happened in history. And so we use water, as in Holy Communion, we use the fruit of the grape and bread, because those are what Jesus gave us to use. So here is water. Why do we baptize? We baptize because baptism, which is a sign or symbol of the gospel, of God's forgiving love, that is applied now to us through action, through symbol as well as through words. And that will communicate across every culture. Uh, and then second, what's the meaning of it? What are we, we doing? As I have said, uh, it is expressing good news. It's very interesting how Luke, in his account of Acts, simply says that he spoke or preached the good news of Jesus, and then immediately that's followed by, here is water. What is there to hinder my being baptized? He immediately links the two. They, they have that association. Now, Water, as we've said, has a variety of meanings. Uh, and what can we use? You can understand, obviously, that uh, if you were baptizing somebody who was an adult, who had heard the message preached, that water, which expresses the cleansing, the washing of their life clean, that would express something. Or water that enlivens, that would express, that gives life. But the, the New Testament has other ways of speaking about the meaning of baptism, which are important to hold on to, and which came out, for example, uh, in the reading from Galatians, uh, where it talks about you, have, you are sons of God through faith in Christ, and then goes on immediately to say, uh, for those who were baptized into Christ have put on or clothed themselves with Christ. I ought perhaps to say here that uh, in the early church, people actually stripped off for baptism. And that was one reason why uh, in the early centuries they had baptistries separate uh, so that there could be a, a discreet stripping off. People were immersed in the water and then came out and then clothed themselves with new clothes. So they sensed they were putting on a new life, beginning a new life. Well, that is tremendous. But you say, well, don't we mostly baptize children? Does that seem a way that we can express it. But the New Testament has another very powerful way of speaking about baptism that we can see more obviously when it comes to children as well as to adults. And that is, it speaks about being adopted, becoming, in that sense, children of God, sons and daughters of God. Now, 
most of us, perhaps all of us, I do not know, uh, were born of our uh, parents, our biological parents were our father and our mother. Uh, but not everyone. There are many who are adopted. They come into a new family. And so that that may happen to them, of course it could happen when they're seven or eight or in their teens, but it will often happen when they are days or weeks or months old. It is the most important moment in their life. And yet they will know nothing about it. It happened long before they were conscious of anything happening. It is uh, so uh, easy for us to think of baptism and becoming a Christian as something that we do. But that is not something that we do. We are baptized. There are religions where people put themselves into the water and bathe. They baptize themselves. What is striking is that the one who is associated with baptism above all in the New Testament is John the Baptist. And he's called that John the Baptist, the baptizer. He did the baptizing. And so this is what happens, whether to adults or to children. They are baptized. They don't baptize themselves. It is something done to them. Now, of course, that makes people uh, a little anxious. They say, well, no, we, we can just about understand that for adults, but what about children? Are you not talking about magic? Something done to them. But adoption is done to you. And what can be more important than adoption for a child without, at that point, parents or without parents who will love and care for him or her? And if we can imagine that uh, a cat jumping into a pram might have an effect on a child, why should not baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit not have an effect which we cannot understand or measure? But as I say, adoption takes you into a wholly new life which will nourish and enliven you. And then third, who is to be baptized? And when the response of the Ethiopian eunuch was, here is water, what is there to hinder my being baptized? The response then of Philip is, if you believe wholeheartedly, or with all your heart, as in the translation we had. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Or I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He had responded to this message of God's forgiving love made known to him in Jesus Christ. And he committed himself in his mind, but wholeheartedly with his whole life, to Christ. And therefore there was nothing to hinder the baptizing, and he was baptized. But you see, baptism there is linked with faith, and it was in Galatians when we spoke, uh, when we read from that passage. Uh, you are sons of God through faith in Christ. There is our response of faith, but then there is the... Uh, empowering of that by the, the sign and symbol of baptism. But that was the response of the first generation of Christians. They were obviously men and women who heard the word preached. But the question would very soon arise among them, what about our children? What about them? Now, if they were Jews, they would say, but the very covenant that God made with us, right back with Abraham, that we were his people, and that this was to be true for his descendants after him. And as a sign of that, our, our sons on the eighth day were circumcised. They were brought into the people of God. If 
before this renewal of God's people through Christ took place. Our children were part of God's people. Are they not now part of God's people? This strong sense in the ancient world of solidarity, of the family. You find this also in 1 Corinthians 7 where Paul is speaking about even the unbelieving husband being in some sense made holy through the faith of his wife and the other way around. And that would be the response of a Jewish parent, but but what about a non-Jewish parent, the Gentiles? Well, if a Gentile entered the people of God before the coming of Christ, known as a proselyte, you come across the word a convert, you come across it in the New Testament on occasion. They were baptized when they came in, they were not circumcised, then they were baptized, it was known as proselyte baptism, and their children baptized with them. So again, they would have this sense, how can it be now that our children are not part of God's people if we are. And so we come to the reading we have from the Gospel. The, the stories in the Gospel are not everything that happened in the ministry of Jesus. We, we were noticing that last time when we were looking at uh, the end of the 20th chapter of John where it says many other things that Jesus did. Now this story of children being brought to Jesus, what is the context in which they would have used that story? The most natural context would have been, well what about our children? And the disciples would remember, well Jesus in his earthly life took a child in his arms when we were saying, no, no, you're you're not ready for it yet, you're only a child, took him in his arms and said, The kingdom of God belongs to them. And if the kingdom belongs to them, then what is there to hinder their being baptized? But of course that is where the parents are themselves believing, or one of them, and part of the life of the Christian community. Because as I used to say to people who came, as it were, out of the blue, wanting their child to be done, as they might say, much as if it were going to be vaccinated, but in a spiritual kind of way, uh, not painful, but perhaps cold for a brief moment. Um, And I'd have to say, it is like adoption. When a child is adopted, you don't put it in the attic to get on with life by itself. You nourish it within the life of the family. And if someone is to be baptized, they are to be nourished within the Christian family. If you are not part of the Christian family, if you don't enable your child to grow up within the Christian family, it is like adopting a child and putting it into the attic. It is like telling a child, cabbage is good for you, and then they notice after a little while that it never seems to appear on your plate, but only on theirs. You and I have been baptized. What does it mean? It means that God has made, through that sign, probably before we knew anything about it, he has adopted us as children in his family. And that's where we belong. And however (coughs) our lives may be lived, however badly, whatever doubts we may have, We need to remember that. Luther, and we shall next year celebrate the uh, uh, 500th uh, anniversary of uh, Luther's discovering of the depth of the Christian faith. Luther said when he went through doubts as he did so often, uh, he was a very complicated or complex character. Luther would write in Latin, baptizatus, and I have been baptized. In other words, I belong to God and he takes me as his own. Whatever I may be going through at the moment, that was the one reality in his life that he held on to long before he had done anything to deserve it. And you and I, while we remember 
But being baptized is putting on a new life, as you may put on new clothes. We are to put on a new life in Christ, and to allow that to happen day by day, we need also to remember that baptism, which is in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, means that we now belong to God by his action, not our action. And therefore, nothing in the end needs separate us from his love. Let us pray. God our Father, help us to know that in our being baptised, we have been made children in your family and grant that your spirit may each day enable us to grow and mature as Christian men and women. Grant that whatever doubts and anxieties, whatever failings, whatever severe failings of word or deed may happen in our lives, Help us to know that your forgiving love was there at our beginning and is there until our end. And help us, therefore, every day anew to profess that you are our Father. I have been baptized. Amen.